Hi, and welcome to Meet the Wizard. I'm Yael, and our guest today is Dr. Deborah Thompson, founder and president of One Health Lessons. Hi, Deborah, and thanks for being here with us. Thank you so much, Yael, for this wonderful invitation uh, opportunity to have a conversation. Yeah, thank you. Um, before we start having this conversation, could you, please, could you please give us a little bit about yourself, your background? Sure, I'll, I'll give you the Cliff Notes version of it because <laughs> my career has not been a, a ladder. It's been more like a jungle gym. <laughs> so I've been all over the place. But my background is I am a, an American and a Canadian. So that in itself is uh, pretty fun. But I also have a bachelor's of music. I also have a bachelor's of science from uh, McGill University up in Canada. Mm -hmm. And then I was teaching yeah, primary school, secondary school students, as well as adults. And then I became a veterinarian. And that's wow. when I heard about One Health. And we're going Excellent. to be going into One Health, which is my passion, as well as teaching, which is my other passion. <laughs> so really looking forward to this conversation. And I also just wrote a book. Oh, wow, amazing. So we'll talk about it after <laughs> afterward. Uh, so we, we're gonna talk basically about passion today, if I understand correctly. Amazing. Um, so you, you mentioned One Health, and this is a, a very hot topic, and uh, probably one of the topics in the life sciences ecosystem that has the most misconceptions about it. So could you please give us a little bit uh, of information and just an explanation about what it is specifically? Right. Right. Thanks for the opportunity because I did not know what One Health was until I was already in my professional school when I was already in my mid twenties. And I thought, my gosh, why didn't I know about this when I was six years old? Why didn't I know about this decades ago? Right? Mm -hmm. So for the benefit of everybody, One Health can be explained simply in two different sentences. One Health can be explained in a concept and an approach. The concept is the interconnection between our health and the health of the environment, animals, and plants. It mm -hmm. makes sense, right? Sick environment, sick people. Then the One Health approach, put simply, is teamwork. It's teamwork between people of various strengths, various backgrounds, various disciplines. Mm -hmm. We come together and we prevent and we solve complicated problems, like a pandemic, for instance. Yeah, but when you say like that, it seems very simple and it should be widely accepted yet we are not there yet and we we have a lot of initiatives that are tried but that nothing is really coming through from what from my understanding so how do you explain uh the resistance against something that seems to be so obvious and that is working for the, the common good i call that variable the human factor mm -hmm. because teams rely on people and people are human so what do we need to do as science advocates as one health advocates now that we all know what one health is mm -hmm. we have to be able to not only communicate within our own bubbles as i call yeah. it career bubbles. so i'm a veterinarian right i speak with veterinarians all the time i'm comfortable in that space yeah. But let's try to broaden that bubble. Let's try to even pop that bubble. Let's be comfortable speaking with people of various backgrounds and disciplines, because that's yeah. ultimately how we can solve some major, major problems. But it comes down to communication. Yeah. Basically, the One Health approach is uh, something synergetic between the human health issues and the environment issues and the animal health and animal welfare. Uh, issues at the same time. So basically it's supposed to involve to involve all these industries together and, and to work on something that sounds even more ambitious than what they are doing right now, each one in, in its own uh, field. So yeah, you got it exactly there, Yael, when you said synergy. Yeah. That's exactly what it is because it's not up to one profession, one person to save the world, right? Yeah. <laughs> You have to synergize our strengths. I am not a particle physicist. I am not a data an analyst or a data scientist, but mm -hmm. I would love speaking with them because mm -hmm. we can bounce ideas back and forth and see how we can progress and advance our knowledge uh, to benefit society. Absolutely. Actually, I read a lot about uh, One Health 
lately, I mean, in the past month because of the pandemics, because suddenly it, it became a, a, a hot topic and something that people were interested about. But do we have a possibility to talk about it uh, except for pandemics? I mean, on a regular basis and not only when it's probably too late? Excellent question. The answer is yes, mm -hmm. but you need to have strong communication skills. You yeah. have to have that sight because I said very simply at the start, it's the interconnection between our health and the health of everything around us, right? That could be talking about antibiotic resistance, mm -hmm. right? That could be talking about mental health. That could be talking about plastic pollution and microplastics and drinking water, right? Yeah. So just like anything else in life, it, you get out what you put in. And if you're putting into the conversation an open mind, then you're mm -hmm. able to get that much more out of the conversation. Sounds logical. But do, do you think that uh, the, the industries, I'm talking about the private sector for now, but do you, do you, do you think the industries uh, include already the One Health in their development strategy, in their R&D, for instance, or in their uh, policies uh, of collaboration with the uh, other stakeholders? I think compared to five years ago, it's moving in that direction, but it's far from finished. It okay. is not enough at this point. I think once people start to realize the potential in that synergy, and uh, when I say potential, it's not just you know the sheer benefit of the planet, but also economic potential, mm -hmm. that's when people are going to start to invest. And the way to bring in more people is to make sure you understand the values and the priorities of the other people you're trying to speak with. Absolutely. So to you, what the, uh, as a One Health uh, expert, you have been facing a lot of, uh, of uh, projects and a lot of situations. What, according to you, is the main issue or the main issues that you are facing or that the people that are involved there are facing to promote these initiatives? So what is the, qu the question is, what do One Health advocates or people who are trying to um, advance One Health missions and activities, where are the hindrances, where are the barriers? Yeah. Oftentimes, and I was a part of the um, ministerial meeting of the Global Health Security Agenda back in October of 2020, mm -hmm. and that question was asked. And I was amongst lots of wonderful professional uh, experts, worldwide experts. It was an honor to be there as it is here. And, and they all said the same thing. It's money. It's funding. They don't have the funding. They don't have the support by the people who are in powerful positions to advance their mission and to get their research to the next level mm -hmm. to be applied. You know, it, it could be theoretical, but it needs to be applied. Absolutely. So, and the yes. money is supposed to come from which pockets? I mean, are the private stakeholders supposed to be involved money-wise, or do you think it's more uh, the public system that is supposed to fund these initiatives? I think it's fair to say, well, every country is different, right? Yeah. Every government is different. So I can't have a blanket statement, right? Because of just logistic. But I think it's fair to say, in order to answer that question, is before we figure out who is really giving us the money, whoever us is, right, um, we have to have wholehearted acceptance that that interconnection is a real thing, our lives are dependent on it, and that ultimately changes society. When we get people really just knowing and growing up that this, you know, is a normal thing. This is my actions littering can bring wild animals closer to people. And those wild animals might be able to bring diseases to us or we could bring diseases to them, right? Yeah. So it's having that mindset. Um, with that, social changes will happen, laws will change because of social pressures. And so I have worked in my career from 
the top down and the bottom up. So grassroots organizations like One Health Lessons. Got it. So the more I hear you, the, the more I feel like One Health and, all what, and everything that is around it is supposed to be very widely accepted. I mean, it's, it's logical, it feels organic in terms of comprehension. So, and it's not the case. I mean, so far we, we see baby steps and we see a lot of uh, initiatives from NGOs and from uh, people that, uh, I mean, from uh, people that are thinking like you, I mean, organizations, but in terms of funding, in terms of uh, global understanding and involvement, I, I don't feel like we are there. So we miss something because when you talk about it, it seems really easy to understand and, and in, in, an, in an immediate way. We, you don't have to think twice about the fact that we need to protect our environment, uh, the, the, the animals that are living with us and ourselves as, as a whole, not as things that are separated. So probably, and, and I know this is a topic that is, that is uh, close to your heart, the communication is key here meaning to find the right way to talk to the right people. So we have the right people to identify, which is why I asked you, do we have to go to public stakeholders, private companies, but also how to, how to talk to them and how to present this. And I, I don't love the word lobbying, but it's basically we have to find a way to lobby for these kind of initiatives and where, where do you think we are we are right now and how do you see things evolving in terms of communication? Well, well, first off, thank you so much for that compliment. I don't know if we, that, the compliment was that you said it was easy to understand. Yeah. I've sat in meetings where the definition of One Health has been argued for three hours. So it means a lot to me that you said that it was easy to understand when I explained it. Thank you very much for that. But that is one of the reasons why I wrote the book. Uh, before I go into the book a little bit more, yeah. I also want to emphasize the importance of, if we're all scientists here, one way or the other, and my loose definition of a scientist is anybody who's curious. I ask the kids when I go and teach as a science role model in schools, I ask the kids, raise your hand if you can, yeah. if you're a curious person. And most of them do. I'm like, you are going to be a fantastic scientist. Yeah. I, this is a definition I gave myself when I decided to go to science. So I'm with you completely. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. so, you know, never use, never lose that curiosity. But the thing is with time, the farther we go into our academic studies, the farther we go down that rabbit hole or that niche or that bubble, the mm -hmm. further removed we are from the general public. That's true. So how can we become the best science communicators you can be? It's by talking to people who have no background in science and you have to explain it really clearly as if you're speaking with a six-year-old or an eight-year-old. And this is how you talk to uh, to policymakers, for instance. Do you think you have we have to go to this level? Yeah, I have to say, I have to say that with um, many many hours under my belt of teaching children, it has made my life on Capitol Hill in Washington D.C. substantially easier. I can mm -hmm. say that from personal experience. Okay, I understand. I understand because one of the one of the factors of success for uh, promoting these policies, we clearly talk to policymakers and politics, and politicians. So you have to find the right language and the right approach to talk to them, knowing that they are busy people and that they have other factors that to take into consideration that you are not aware about. So how do you do that? How, how do you? prepare someone with a project or a, a project order? How do you prepare them to go to a policymaker? Excellent question. There are so many things that I covered in this yeah. book, but we'll, I will highlight some of them. Timing is essential. You can go into the same office one day versus the next 
have the same conversation and have it received a different way. Mm -hmm. Because the priorities of that senator or of that representative, or again, wherever you are in that world, in the world, members of parliament, um, they have various priorities depending on what their constituents or what their voters want, yeah. um, what's happening in the home district, right? Yeah. So timing and being aware of your surroundings is of utmost importance. Um, so that also ties into knowing their priorities. Yeah, right. absolutely. This is what and I felt when I read your, your book, actually, because I had the pleasure to read a few, to read a few chapters uh, of this book. And, uh, and I think it's, uh, it's uh, a must read, actually, for everyone that is working with science communication. Um, and uh, and what, was, what struck me was that you stress out the fact that you need to build a very strong communication strategy, but not only what, what, which word you will use, but how you will use it in front of who, in, and to look at the environment in terms of what, is, what are the news and what are the, the external circumstances that are not related to your project at all, but that are in the set of priorities of the people you are talking to. And I was amazed to read some things that to me were trivial. I mean, it was, I, I thought it was already something that people knew. And the fact that you stress it out means that it's not. And people still need to be taught about how to communicate and how to deliver a message efficiently. And this, this is probably one of the reasons when it comes to One Health, we still have an issue to pass the message on. Right, thank you. Um, that was another wonderful compliment <laughs> you paid. But you know, it just reminds me of when I was working as a science policy advisor on Capitol Hill in Washington, DC, I was the token scientist and the office where I was working was actually the largest um, in uh, largest personal office in all of the United States government. And I was the token scientist. So whenever there were scientists coming in, they said, okay, Deb, um, can you take this meeting? Uh, or can you sit in this meeting with us? And then after the meeting, my colleagues are like, either can you translate that for us? Or did that just happen? Or what did they want? Yeah. So I had to translate, you know, the dirty, uh, itty bitty details, the minute mm -hmm. details of what was provided and actually yeah. made it accessible um, for my colleagues in policy. Um, and the reason why I wrote this book is because I can't do this alone. I need more people yeah. to have these skills. Yeah. 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 So it's a, it's a question, of, first of all, it's a question of level of communication. Like you said before, you have to understand, you have to adapt yourself as a communicator to the audience you have. And not everyone in the public institutions is a scientist. And sometimes scientists also need uh, a pedagogic approach, uh, especially if they are resistant to the subject. So you have to find you know, a, a more convincing way to, to pass the message. And so the, the first key is the, the, the choice of uh, communication level and of uh, lexicon and how you, how you present the thing. And the, the, the other thing that was really important in the book is the, you, you already said it, but the timing and also and the really, you know, the timing in terms of environment, the things that are going on uh, in terms, when there is the start, the onset of the pandemic, this is probably not the best timing Although it's, I mean, it supposedly could be a great timing to talk about it because people would be more receptive, but they are too busy dealing with the, with the everyday job. So they don't have the time to be available in terms of active listening. And I mean, people probably are mistaken by the fact, yeah, it's the pandemic right now. I have to go with my One Health project and present it to the Congress. And they are busy with other stuff and people don't realize it. Right, let me let me uh, piece that out a little bit more. Yeah. So say at the very start of the pandemic, um, it's a different feeling in governments, I imagine around the world compared to now. Well, again, it depends on what country you live in. 
But say if you're at the start of another outbreak, another wave, then what the government is focusing on is putting out those fires, right? And I put those in quotes, like putting out, um, stopping further advancement of those outbreaks, right? That's the priority. You're not going to be necessarily talking to them about a long-term plan of creating a, a One Health committee or a One Health office in federal government, right? Yeah. But timing is everything. And right around now, end of 2021, certainly in 2022, that's when that's when people, One Health advocates, scientists and engineers and mathematicians and technologists, everybody around the world with a passion and an interest in promoting more, uh, not only research, but STEM education and STEAM education, um, that's the time to become um, mobilized and speak your your mind speak your your story and share your story with yeah. people of substantial power and do you feel this is the case right now because we are 18 months after the first outbreak of the pandemic of the COVID-19 and of course the situation is not behind us but we are in a far less in a, in a far better situation than what we have been uh, before I mean we get we are getting vaccinated and we are more protected and we are more aware also. I mean, the thing is, um, do you think now this is the right timing, first of all, and do you see things moving? I, I think to focus on the awareness, now's a good time to become aware. Mm -hmm. The time to push is probably going to be after the Delta variant or whatever variant is afterward, you know, um, is dealt with. But the but you have to start somewhere and you can start building relationships. Yeah. And, and, and do, you, do you observe that? I mean, do you feel like right now bridges are being built between the different stakeholders uh, in terms of, it can be also in terms of education and market education, but also in terms of public private partnerships, are, are things moving right now or are, st are we still in the pandemic phase? I don't think there's enough public and private mm -hmm. partnerships at this point, particularly in public education. And yeah. that is what has been scaring me for the longest time, honestly. Um, because if you don't have the public understanding the importance of One Health, if you don't have the public understanding the science you can whittle down the mRNA vaccine into simple science, believe it or not. I've done it in a lesson. <laughs> I've taught eight year olds that it is possible. Um, it is possible, but there needs to be more um, accessibility and interest. And the way to garner this interest is to understand the needs of your audience. And particularly with kids, you have to have them have fun, uh, laugh, play during lessons mm -hmm. that also teach them at the same time as they're playing, they're, yeah. they're learning something that has real world significance, such mm -hmm. as one. Health. Okay. That, yeah, that, that, that sounds really, when you say it sounds e even easy to do, to achieve, but I mean, in the reality, you know, that we, we know both that it's not really the case, but I mean, it gives us hope so that things can move um uh let's go back to you to your book because it, what was really interesting also in the book uh, i found really cool about it is that you give a lot of uh, take home messages and take home tips uh for the lazy people that don't want to read all the book you you summarize it you know in very i mean in very impactful sentences which i mean people nowadays tend to read more, less. So the fact that we have this uh, take home messages was really good to me because it, it gives um, an overview and, uh, and very impactful messages. So do you have uh, some messages you would like to, uh, to share with us uh, today? Ooh, that's a good question. I'm trying. <laughs> that's fun. This is wonderful. I, will say some highlights that I've gotten 
as feedback, I, I have several uh, endorsements in in the book. <laughs> so um, some of the feedback that I've gotten from beta testers, from readers, mm -hmm. um, is that they particularly liked where I was talking about how to approach controversial topics. And actually, one of the <laughs> one of the readers, she's from the UK, and her brother has a very different uh, opinion. Mm -hmm. Okay, very different uh, point of view, let's say. Mm -hmm. And for the longest time, they were just battling, like siblings do, right? And she really surprised him when she sat down and started to do some of the stuff that I discuss in the book. Mm -hmm. And he was caught off guard. He was like, holy cow, I can see my piece. And then they actually had a conversation. And by the end of that conversation, he was like, I see where you're coming from. Mm -hmm. I see, I want to learn more. Can you give me links for this? And that was totally unsolicited, that story. She just, she just approached me and told me that. I thought, awesome. Because yeah. I'm not in the UK, right? Mm -hmm. I'm not in the UK. I don't, I don't, um, I'm not experienced living in that um, society, that culture, mm -hmm. but she has, and family dynamics can be quite rough sometimes. Yeah. And honest sometimes, <laughs> um, but it works. Yeah, this advice works. Yeah, this is something also I, I took from, uh, from reading the book is that, I mean, we, we have to find an empathetic way to, to talk with the other, even when we have several divergence of, I mean, divergence of opinions, we, ha we have to take this as a basis. I mean, we know that from the beginning, we don't agree. It doesn't mean that we can't convince the other one, but we have to find, I mean, not necessarily to be the, the right one. I, I'm not, I not necessarily want to be the right one, but to show the other one that we understand their issues and their questions, but still we think that he should listen also to our point of view. And, and this, it was a mix of pedagogy and, and uh, empathy and, um, and yeah, choose, I mean, knowing who you are talking to. And this is the key. Yeah. I, I, this is clearly for me, one of the key messages is knowing who you are talking to. But knowing, the, knowing them, knowing their background, I mean, trying to learn about their background as much as possible and adapt your message. It's not because your message sounds good and is very elaborated and very sophisticated that it will be heard. On the contrary, it, the simplest, the better to me. And this is what I got also from your book is that choose wisely your words and the people you're giving them to. Basically. Yeah. Yeah. Great. I'm happy that that was conveyed. Mm -hmm. I, I don't like, um, the word convincing or, you know, things like that, but I prefer words like open communication, but sometimes that's overused. So let's just stick to a conversation. Yeah. And a conversation can build trust as long as it's respectful. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I think we're good. Thank you very much, uh, Deborah, for this very insightful conversation and full of hope, actually, because what you told us shows that we are on the good path, even though so far we have baby steps. We made steps uh, in the right direct direction. So let's uh, hope that uh, the future will uh, be bright and, uh, and that One Health will come to light as something very widely accepted. This is my personal wish about it. Uh, it was a pleasure to talk to you today. It was a pleasure. Thank you again for the invitation. Thank you very much.